Forum. I'm pleased to welcome you to this uh, noontime seminar with my uh, friend and colleague, former colleague, I guess, Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook. Uh, Ambassador uh, Cook is really uh, distinguished in many areas. She was appointed by the President as the United States Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. Uh, and as such, she is the principal advisor to both the President of the United States and the Secretary of State on issues of religious freedom globally. She's the first African American and the first female to hold this position. She's the third ambassador at large since the creation of the office under the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act. Prior to joining the State Department, Ambassador Johnson Cook served as the senior pastor and CEO of the Bronx Christian Fellowship Baptist Church in New York City, and she was there from 1996 to 2010. She was also the founder and president of Wisdom Women Worldwide Center, a global center for female faith leaders and the owner of Charisma Speakers, a cross-cultural communications firm and speakers bureau. She has, in her illustrious career, had three presidential appointments, two appointments by cabinet secretaries, and of course was confirmed by the United States Senate in, in her current job. Uh, one of the things that impressed me the most when we were going uh, through the preparations for her hearings on the Hill were, was her work overseas as a peace builder with Operations Cross, Operation Crossroads Africa and World Vision. Uh, and in the Bahamas, bringing together clergy of different faith groups to, uh, to achieve a, a kind of social reconciliation. She also was the chaplain of the New York City Police Department for 21 years, and the only woman, woman to ever serve in that role. As such, she was on the front lines of 9-11. And uh, in addition to New York, she founded, uh, was a founder and a board member of the Multi-Ethnic Center. Um, she's been a pastor to many congregations, and academically, she's been a professor at New York Theological Seminary and at Harvard Divinity School. Uh, I think that I'm going to stop there because she has a lot to say to you today, and uh, we'll, she'll present, and then as usual, uh, I may ask a question or two and then uh, let you all have the podium to ask your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, well, Peter, for your introduction, and thank you for your preparation for my hearings, and I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. I bring you greetings, certainly, from President Obama and Secretary John Kerry, uh, who's a pleasure to serve both of them. Um, as the Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, I'm in the Department of State, and I feel privileged to have this opportunity to advance the cause of international religious freedom for people of all faiths and beliefs around the world. All 199 countries are part of my portfolio. Fifteen years ago, the United States Congress took a momentous step in support of religious freedom, and it passed the International Religious Freedom Act, or the EARTH Act, which created the Office of International Religious Freedom, which I now head. And with this act, the U.S. government made a bold statement on behalf of those who were oppressed because of their faith. This 82% of the world's population believes in something, some higher being. And it was in a Gallup poll recently that religion plays a decisive role in the lives of people, in the pursuit of peace, and it cannot be disconnected from the religious beliefs of people. So we believe that religious freedom is critical to the global stability and to prosperity around the world. President Obama, Secretary Kerry, and I regularly speak out against religious violence and discrimination committed in the name of religion. As ambassador at large, I know people who are persecuted because of their faith. I've met with them personally. I've been in places as diverse as Nigeria, China, Vietnam, Uzbekistan. And while there in diplomatic engagement, I urge foreign officials, some of whom have now become partners with us in our efforts to advance religious freedom globally, we urge them to honor the international human rights commitments Secretary Kerry recently reaffirmed that our commitment to religious freedom is strong, and he said that the promotion of international religious freedom is a priority for President Obama, and it's a priority for me as Secretary of State. He says, I'm making certain and will continue to that religious freedom remains an integral part of our global diplomatic engagement. 
As part of this commitment, both the President and Secretary have now called for the release of an Iranian-American pastor who has been sentenced to eight years in prison on charges related to his religious beliefs, as well as others who are unjustly imprisoned in Iran because of their beliefs and their conscience. President Obama has urged an end to anti-Muslim violence in Burma, and has expressed his readiness to work with the government, civil society, and the international community to promote the rights of every person in Burma, including the right to manifest religion or belief in worship. But we find that government action alone is really not enough to stop religious intolerance. What it takes is government and civil society working together, frequently at the local level, to make a substantive change. Last April 2013, Secretary Kerry renewed the mandate for what's now called the Strategic Dialogue with Civil Society. It was first initiated by Secretary Clinton and now it's renewed. And as part of this initiative, I co-chair the Religion and Foreign Policy Working Group, which brings together the Department of State officials and civil society leaders to promote international religious freedom. Ideally, a force for good Religion often, too often really, becomes a catalyst for violence. If religion is a source of conflict, then it also must be a part of the solution. So therefore, it only makes sense to include religious leaders in conflict resolution. Fortunately, I am a religious leader and I come to the role as one, having pastored, as Peter said, uh, three congregations, having worked in, in, on the front lines of 9-11, having been a part of what's called the Partnership of Faith of New York City, where clergy leaders of all faiths come together. And so we find that religious leaders need to be part of conflict resolution. Because brokering sustainable peace across competing political, ethnic, and religious interests is really no easy task. Sadly, the way the international community tries to build peace and security today just isn't getting the job done. As President Obama said in Jerusalem last March, peace will have to be made among people, not governments. In spite of earnest efforts, active conflicts continue unabated around the world, undermining religion, excuse me, undermining regional and global stability and ravaging entire populations. More than half of the peace agreements fail within five years of being made. So there's a segment of society whose presence is often noticeably absent or lacking in peace building, and that's women. Women have proven ourselves as powerful catalysts for change, yet they're typically excluded from both the negotiations that make peace and the institutions that maintain it. So while it's true that some women engage in conflict activities, many more are victims. And so we've coined a phrase now called the female faces of faith, where we're beginning to focus on women because too few are empowered to be instruments of peace and security. Over the past 25 years, hundreds of peace treaties have been signed, but only a handful of negotiators have been women. Nevertheless, women have been working behind the scenes, across religious divides, to speak on behalf of marginalized groups. And we find that such consensus building and sensitivity to the needs of half the population could go far towards achieving just, and sustainable peace. In far too many countries, women are marginalized not only in civic and political life, but certainly also in formal religious spaces, and they lack official roles. But this very marginalization often also frees them from the bureaucratic constraints. So unlike our male counterparts, women can be perceived as non-threatening, without a political agenda, and able to understand and articulate the needs of other women. So working behind the scenes, we find that many women feel free to network with other women. And despite this invisibility, women of faith have put themselves on the front lines of peace building. Here are a few examples. There's a young Syrian-born Islamic scholar who's passionately devoted to empowering and training women and youth. For security reasons, I can't mention her name, but for the past two years, this woman has been developing work opportunities and job skill training for Syrian women in refugee groups and camps. And with minimal donor investment, she's provided food baskets to more than 4,100 families. She's found employment for 700 women, each of whom supports a family in cafeterias and developed a craft industry where women can receive the income from the goods that they produce. 
She's also helped provide job opportunities and training for refugee families in need, regardless of their faith background. And then we find there's an Afghan woman, Jamila Afghani, who heads a local Afghan women's NGO, non-governmental organization. And she said these words, I've often heard that Afghan women are not political, that peace and security is man's work. But she says, I am here to challenge that illusion. And challenge it, she does. Her NGO has developed peace education, human rights, and gender training from an Islamic perspective. But also let me tell you about the extraordinary women of Liberia. In 2003, thousands of women came together to pray for peace, and then they staged a nonviolent protest outside of the presidential palace in Liberia. They were armed with nothing more than courage and prayer. They were mothers, they were grandmothers, aunts, daughters, Christians, and Muslims, and they stood together against opposing forces. And their faith and actions were a critical element in bringing about an agreement between the Liberian government and the rebel forces during stalled peace talks. There are many and scores of examples like these of women who are taking faith and taking on peace building initiatives using their faith around the world. Now these women, they face huge security risks and they take huge security risks for reasons beyond financial gain or fame or political traction. So where do these women find their courage? While disproportionately affected by conflict, women have been the emotional and the spiritual background of war-affected communities. Women have mobilized their communities for peace, they've mediated disputes, and they've found ways to help the community step away from the violence. So these actions challenge our notions of what peace-building work really is. Because in too many places, religion is cited as a reason to persecute those who follow a different faith or are perceived as different because of race, ethnicity, culture, gender, or sexual orientation. So women of faith often sideline themselves. They built peace advocating for the dignity and respect of marginalized individuals. Some including women, children, persons with disabilities, religious and ethnic minorities. And we're working very closely with women in uh, what's now known as the Treaty for Disabilities, or CRPD. And US ratification of the Disabilities Convention would enable us to better support the work of the faith community to advance the rights of people with disabilities internationally, benefiting all disabled people, including Americans with disabilities, who wish to travel, work, study, reside, retire overseas, or worship. In Israel, and many of you have heard, that female faith leaders and civil society activists who are leading the charge to build a country that truly embraces gender equality. Annette Hoffman is chair of the Women of the Wall, and she's also the executive director of the Israeli Religions Action Center and she continues to lead the fight to desegregate the Western Wall in Jerusalem, Jude Judaism's holiest site. Every month for almost 25 years, Anat Hoffman and Women of the Wall have prayed at the Western Wall. And every month for almost 25 years, they were arrested and violating the, for, for violating the Orthodox rules regarding female prayer. But with Anat's leadership, things are changing. In fact, this past month, for the very first time, Anat and the Women of the Wall were not arrested when they prayed at the Western Wall. And so every month now, they will continue to pray. Step by step, they are literally changing the face of gender equality and religious freedom in Israel. So we need to bring more women to the table. I'm happy to be at the table, but we need to bring more women to be at the table to be seen, to be heard, to be empowered to amplify their voices. In December 2011, President Obama and then Secretary Clinton released the United States National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. And this ensures that US peace and security efforts fully integrate women as peace negotiators, leaders in reconstruction, and as beneficiaries of relief. If we truly wish for enduring and lasting peace around the world, then we've got to ensure that women are at the table as full and equal participants in all peace-building efforts. Because to be truly effective, 
both men and women have to partner together, each with our talents brought to the table and to collaborate in a respective, inclusive way. So many of my civil society partners are also in agreement with us. One says that we must, we miss action and we miss traction when we engage only the male leaders. And that came from a male. So surely religion can be part of a source of reconciliation and it can also be part of conflict resolution. And surely faith can motivate people to courageously take action for peace. Women are assuredly undertaking such work at great cost, at great personal risk, and speaking up and speaking out. And so it's my pleasure and honor to be with you today. I look forward to hearing from you, for your, both your comments and your questions. And I look forward to partnering with you, that you might join us in the efforts to promote religious freedom around the world. And that is our task, and that's our mission, and I've happily accepted it for now two and a half years. And so it is my honor to be with you, and I certainly want to thank those from the Rumi Forum for your invitation to be here. It's taken a while for us to be here, but we're so glad to be with you today. I want to thank you for the invitation. It is our honor to be with you and to support and encourage you in the work that you do, uh, bringing people together, not just at lunchtime, but the work that you do throughout the year. So thank you thank so you. much, sir. Okay. And Jenna. Well, thank you. I would like to ask the uh, question. Okay. And that is, you've experienced conflict situations both in your NGO work and your work with the U.S. government. Can you generalize about the circumstances where religion be, is kind of a narrow source of identity that builds walls between people and when uh, and how though religion can, on the other hand, be used to transcend those barriers and make human connection where other factors uh, than the economic scarcity, more concrete factors would drive people apart. Do you have a... You know, I found just both in my life experience as well as my work as ambassador that walls are built when people are fearful and ignorant of the other culture. And what happens is through interfaith efforts, walls can come down. Many times people really don't understand who's on the other side talking with them or trying to talk with them. And I have found that more walls have been shattered than walls that have been built up. The fact that I'm a faith leader, and it does not matter what faith I am, the fact that people understand that I have been a faith leader is a pragmatic opening for dialogue. Because there's a common respect amongst religious leaders that at least this person understands at least where I'm coming from. So I have found many doors to be open. I also found like at the end of 9-11, um, being on the front lines as a chaplain, you know, this New York City for the first time really had the rug pulled from under us. There, nobody ever thought that something like that would happen in New York City. And what happened was when the rug was pulled down, walls had to come down because for, we were all victims. We were all fearful. We were all trying to find out what had happened. And the late Arthur Kaliander, who used to be the pastor of Marble Collegiate Church, brought together clergy leaders of all faiths. Christians, Muslim, Buddhists, uh, Jewish, and we began what he called the Partnership of Faith for New York City because we had to collectively find answers to how we would now perceive a new normal. Mm -hmm. On the other side of 9-11, we had to return to some kind of normality, but it was a new normal that had to be created. And what was happening was we didn't just exchange pulpits, we also exchanged social lives. And so our families had social events together. We were in each other's pulpits. We had dialogue around a, a table together. And it became a model that I used actually when I came to the State Department to have faith lead around tables. But what it began was people talking to each other and not about each other or not resisting one another. And for, you know, I went back, I just came back from the CFR, the Council of Foreign Relations, just last night. So I'm, I'm just fresh off the train. But in that room were some of the leaders that I had partnered with. And now, now they are leaders in different capacities in New York City as religious leaders. But we're friends, which, you know, 20 years ago, we would have no reason to sit down together, or we found no reason to sit down together. So I think that more walls can come down when dialogue and interfaith efforts happen, which is why this is so important, to continue to pursue interfaith efforts and where they don't exist, to build them because the building of interfaith efforts knocks down walls. I've got to ask you one more question. Have you, or can you give examples of situations where in fact it was more the civil society element that pushed clergy 
to to take a lead or where civil society took a lead and clergy followed? I mean, well, see, clergy are part of civil society. Right, I mean, okay. they, but, so, uh, but um, I mean, informal. Informally, you know, there are t you know with the strategic dialogue that was exist that exists now, a strategic dialogue with civil society. We have some um, civil society leaders, Bill Venley, Chris Seipel, who run NGOs that were able to be able to say <coughs> things perhaps a little um, more freely than government could say it, or perhaps more freely than other religious leaders could say it. But it's a partnership. They're, we all have to be on the same page. So at least they can say some things, and they can kind of push the envelope a little bit. But at the end of the day, you know, we have to have a common voice. So I think that you have to have more efforts like that, strategic dialogue with civil society, with government, people sitting side by side and not talking to what we call really a ground up approach. Yeah, where no, civil, yeah, really what I yeah. Mean, civil society is, you know, ground, because they can say things sometimes that government is restricted to say, I mean, we have talking points, we have part, points that have to be cleared, and very, you know, likely so, because we make sure the president's messaging and the secretary's messaging is going out, and what they don't want to go out, we don't say. But there's, certainly with, there's a ground up approach where civil society can really push, push us and you know we're creating some wonderful opportunities through this strategic dialogue. Um, one of the other things that we were able to do was um, bring the experts over to the State Department hosted the first experts meeting where we were able to not only have civil society involved but the people who are the practitioners on the ground. Um, you know, not the diplomats who, who do it across government dialogue tables, but those who are experts in making sure that religious discrimination does not happen in their countries. Nice. Why don't we open it up? I can't imagine you don't have some questions. I know you have questions. I saw you nodding with me, so <laughs> I made eye contact. <laughs> yes. So Tell me your name if you would, please, and where you're from. Yeah. My name is Fitra Mohammed, and I'm from uh, the nation's mosque, Master Mohammed, mm -hmm. and I'm very happy to be here with My you, pleasure. Ambassador Cook. Like, um, um, Ambassador Cook, is there more conversation um, from my travels and talking uh, with interfaith groups? I've learned to identify that all of the religions are very similar. Words may be different, but the meanings have they are same meanings, whether it's Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. But what I've learned, and there's more conversation, and I want to know in your circles, are there more conversations to differentiate between culture and religion? Let me answer that in two ways. One is that you cited the three Abrahamic faiths, and they are very closely similar, because they have the same, at least the Old Testament is the similar book. Um, you know, but there are other faiths, you know, we have to represent every faith that identifies as a faith um, or believes or not believes. I think, you know, culture is an important aspect, and I think that's one of the things that we've been trying to do as we go now in diplomatic engagement, okay. is look at the cultural aspects that affect what is happening. Um, so we're looking at systemic approaches and we're looking at cultural approaches because ultimately what we want to have is be able, people to have religious tolerance wherever they are, but you do have to have an understanding of the culture. P um, Peter in his introduction talked about Operation Crossroads Africa, mm -hmm. a program that I've been in. Although it was not faith-based, it was a college program cross-culturally where college students from America lived in, with the indigenous people in Africa. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like a Peace Corps, it was the precursor to the Peace Corps combined with almost like a habitat for humanity. Mm -hmm. So we had to build something that that particular village needed. And in doing so, we had to learn each other's culture. Mm -hmm. Because we couldn't just go over there and start pouring you know, cinder blocks and putting them up. We had to understand who we were with. And they had to understand who was with them. And the most phenomenal friendships. I got a phone call just yesterday, and this was 30 years ago, in terms of, you know, I really want to meet with you. So I think you have to have more um, projects like that. Um, you know, in Jewish cultures, many go over for kibbutz, kibbutz, so they understand not just their religion, but they understand their, their Jewish culture. I think that we have to do that with our indigenous groups, but we also have to do it cross-culturally. And I think more projects like that need to happen. So yeah, the dialogue is beginning, and I think that that's a wonderful opening for conversation. Please introduce yourself. Okay. My name is Ken Bedell. I can. And uh, I am currently, I'll identify myself as being from the Department of Education. 
but uh, what I really like to identify myself as being on the faculty at United Seminary. Oh my gosh, you were a, yes. When you were a student there. And, uh, so, so I could address you as a Reverend Ambassador. Always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a doctor, I got my doctorate there. Oh yeah, we got to so get all that The long title, the that's, whole thing. That's right, yeah. Reverend Doctor Ambassador. <laughs> so. <laughs> Good. Uh, the, the question that I have is, I, I really love the illustration of Liberia that, yeah. that you use, and it seems like it's such an important uh, and uh, important story. But uh, Mozambique seems to me to be kind of another side of that story, namely that, that like Gracia, Michelle, and women were extremely important in uh, bringing bringing peace there mm -hmm. and, and find, you know, mm -hmm. finally working that out. Um, it, uh, I, I visited there now, that would be five or six years ago, and it seemed like the men, the, the, the women were gone from like, like Gracia Michelle was the Secretary of Education, and, mm -hmm. and now that was um, back in the hands of, man, of a man. But, um, the, what, are the, what are the characteristics do you think that make it possible to transfer the, the activism and the success that the women have like in Liberia into, into sustainable political participation? That's a great question. And what we want to do is also highlight more bright spots where religious freedom and tolerance are working. So if you can give us more on that, I know we, we've been dealing with Mozambique, but if you can give us more details, that'd be helpful. You know, I, as a woman faith leader and as a woman <laughs> all of my life, I think that there are just some patience aspects that we have because many times because we've had to sit on the sidelines, we've been able to watch the plays of the game. Mm -hmm. And so when it's time to get into the game, we know them well. We know them from the opposing side and we know them from the proactive side. And I think, you know, think, one of the things about peace building and anything is that timing is important. And so when it's your time to move, you can imagine that women have really either had it up to here or that they say this is the time for us to make the difference and to make the change. And so I think patience is the greatest virtue. I think, you know, I played basketball in New York pre-Title IX. Um, and I used to play on the, you'd sit on the courts for a long time on the sidelines, you know, because in, that, in those days only guys played, you know. Um, women were tomboys. They didn't call us athletic females. So if you wanted to put on some sneakers, you would call a tomboy. And I would go down every single day and watch the guys play. And one day, one guy said, baby girl, if you want to learn the game, you got to get off the sidelines and get in the game. And I got in and got a three-pointer right there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point was I had been watching so long. But at some point, you have to get in the game. And I think that that's what happens with women. We watch, and we watch the plays very intensely, and we watch them very carefully and very prayerfully. And then when it's our time to get in, we're like, we have got the confidence, and we know we have the confidence. So we, it's just about numbers and, and being strategic and not being emotional. And what I say to all the women's groups that I address is we've got to move strategically, not emotionally, so that they can't say, oh, that's just a woman, you know, acting out or whatever. But no, these are women who have been prepared for this season. Um, one of the greatest, um, I got a lot of cards and letters when I came into the ambassadorship, and one was from a, a Jewish person who at that time was celebrating Purim, and said, you know, you're, you're the Esther for this time, for such a time as this, we believe you have come into this office. Mm -hmm. And so I think the timing is delightfully right and divinely right. Mm -hmm. Wait for the mic, please. Thank you. Um, Zulia Shakir, producer and host of Perspectives of Interfaith Television for nine years in Virginia. And, um, and a friend of Peter's. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, I, this is a, a rather hard and difficult question. Um, so I'm not going to paint it as something really easy. This has to do with a lot of women, and a lot of it has to do with culture, I'm sure. The sex trafficking honor killings, um, female genital mutilation, um, rape as a, a weapon of war, and so many other things that are happening to young women, older women, and women sometimes in the name of religion. How do you, 
and your department handle these and who do you speak to in terms of when you meet with someone or a group in different countries? That's great. You know, this is a hard and difficult job, so we get hard and difficult questions. And, and I thank you for the question. We have to, number one, understand, and that's come back to our culture question. We have to understand the culture, and we have to understand when it's being done in the name of religion. So our office sits in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And so all human rights, including all those, those you named, are part of that bureau. We have specific specials or envoys who deal with human trafficking, who deal with the genital mutilation. When it's specifically religion, then we certainly have to come together <coughs> and develop our approach to that. Um, when I speak to governments, it's about religious freedom overall. And if it's specificity to a particular act that's happened or something that's been cited, then I can raise that in that engagement. But we are constantly, we have a human trafficking department in the Bureau. We have, you know, the, everything that you mentioned and cited, we have that by its, it, by its task. Human trafficking has become an administrative priority. I, President Obama last year in October, when he was addressing the Clinton Global Initiative, said, you know, it's slavery, you know, and we're taking it on. So when it's domestic, the Office of White House Faith-Based uh, Initiatives, and when it's domestic and it's religious, the White House Office of Faith-Based Initiatives, where it's across the board, it's, across, it's an intergovernment, across-government approach, and we're tackling it at each level, depending on what it's most directly related to. But believe me, it is not ignored. Sir, I'm back. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm uh, John Langan. I'm a teacher at Georgetown and have been involved in both interfaith work and human rights work over the years. Um, and I, I apologize for coming late. Um, That's no problem. What do you teach at Georgetown? I teach uh, philosophy. Okay. Um, not at the Berkeley Center, at the you know. Well, I'm on the board of the Berkeley Center, okay. but I, I teach in the School of Foreign Okay. Service. Nice to meet you. So, um, and I, I was thinking about the, what your view would be on the potential of bringing environmental issues into a greater um, connection with the, uh, the, the st what I might call the standard agenda of women's rights issues and so on. But this is an er area where the religious traditions are not frozen uh, for the most part, and they can get some experience in working together without crossing very sensitive issues like, such as the traditional gender issues and so on. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, you know, the, it's, a, it's a big department. Peter's worked there as well and continues to work there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many issues that can be related to religion. What we're trying to do is, from a policy perspective, integrate faith into foreign policy and also connect it with this, our national security because those are the two biggest trigger points. And so, in a sense, we have to stay in our lane in terms of that. Not that environment isn't important, mm -hmm. but there are people who are dealing with environment where there's a, a clear nexus that it's mm -hmm. religiously induced or religiously related, then we would come together around the table. But for right now, trying to you know, integrate religion into foreign policy and national security, that's a big play. You know, and, and you know, so you, you got to kind of stay in your lane, otherwise you're all over the place and you get nothing done. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, it's ours as government to government about these particular religious freedoms. The mandate from Congress is to deal with religious freedom. And now whatever else can be connected to that, well, that's more ancillary. But the mandate from Congress is you're to promote or to monitor religious freedom. And that in itself, when 199 countries are part of your portfolio, mm -hmm. that's takes up most of your day. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, you have to kind of stay in your lane to stay focused and have, because you want to have some deliverables. You want to be able to have some deliverables. And so you want to be very focused enough so that you can bring back some. If I could jump in on that one a bit. Please, because cause you, uh, you know the yeah, thing. There was a set of federal regulations promulgated in the, uh, uh, the Bush 43 administration that really enhanced our ability on issues like the environment to, that are secular issues 
to work with uh, faith-based and community organizations when they, in fact, were the, the best agents to carry out a secular agenda. And, and these are very, I, I will say this, and I'm, I'm as cynical as the next person, these are very sensible regulations, and they really allow us to, uh, if we're in a situation uh, where, where people are highly, uh, I think, defined by their faith, and let's say there's a rainforest issue, uh, we can work through a, a faith-based uh, group to, to affect change if that's the best way to do it. Uh, similarly, in uh, some countries where gang violence is, is, a, is a huge problem, and that the, a church or uh, another religious order is the only organization that might have some purchase on the, on the, the imagination and, and maybe the fears of gangs, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Very so. much so. And it goes to Peter's question earlier about, uh, you know, the ground up. I mean, let me stress again that government can't do it alone. You know, we have a huge, you have 52,000 people work for the State Department, but still we have 199 countries around the world. And that's where the partnerships with interfaith groups and NGOs can really, really help. Because again, you can push, and you know the inner workings of a locale. Um, and so you can help, number one, bring some things to light that we won't know, but you can also help push from a local perspective, which also then allows the government to be able to join you in partnership. So I think I want to stress that we can't do it alone. We, we do wonders, but uh, we need to partnerships. Uh, this gentleman and then the gentleman next to him. I'm Seth Hassan Akhlaq from Afghanistan. Uh, a Muslim scholar that uh, work as an advisor for Center for a Study of Islam and Middle East mm -hmm. uh, in Afghanistan affairs, mm -hmm. and I'm involving in the project r related to the interface dialogues and so on. Uh, I have a question or maybe a comment okay. uh, in regards to a specific place, uh, my country, and. Uh, the situation of women and uh, women rights in Afghanistan in regards to the Islamic matters. Uh, you know uh, that uh, women rights uh, is uh, pretend as a, uh, a kind of modern value and a lot of supporter of women rights in Islamic countries, especially in Afghanistan, uh, they fight for uh, women rights while they uh, protest uh, some religious value or uh, it is what happened in our country and it make a obstacle for reaching the women rights <coughs> actually because mm, uh, they make themselves uh, against the traditional value that rooted in the religious viewpoints. So, uh, but uh, fortunately, we have a lot of women in our country that uh, are trying to support modern values such as women rights uh, by new interpretation of some Islamic law. My question is, uh, it is that, uh, do you support them, do you, um, do you know this matter? Because if we want to decrease the uh, expenses for reaching the uh, modern value uh, woman rights, we need to support who mm, uh, some woman or man who, try, who are trying to uh, reach this value through the, their new interpretation of religion that support this value. Uh, but in, con in my country, unfortunately, it happened the other way and may conflict more and more. Okay. So you said you had a question and a comment. So I'm going to mm -hmm. take a comment first, and let me just clarify that I understand what you're saying. That many women actually go up against traditional values, and it causes more problems for them to be able to advance yeah, their yeah, rights. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that you're asking, um, is there a way for women to interpret the traditional law and still have equality? Not only to interpret uh, traditional value, mm -hmm. but more than the, to find a way to the modern values through traditional value sure. by mm -hmm. new interpretation of some Islamic law. Well, uh, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Is there an opportunity in mm -hmm. Afghanistan 
for women to be able to sit with leadership and be able to, using the holy books that you use, be able to voice their concern? Is yeah. there an opportunity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for example, the ulama consul, shuraya ulama, the okay, what highest is, consul. Say that one more time, one time. Yeah. What is that called? Ulama, shuraya ulama, the consul of ulama, the consul yes. of Islamic scholar. Yes, uh huh. Yeah, they include some women. Mm -hmm. But because uh, the Western uh, country do not support them mm -hmm. and support uh, who uh, pretend that uh, support uh, the mother value, human rights, but do not care religious, mm -hmm. so they are not successful in this country mm -hmm. because they back it by only secular values okay. and uh, they are not in the root in the traditional mm -hmm. situation and traditional values. Mm -hmm. but so what we have to do, and I was sat with some of the women of the Council of Ulama in, in Saudi Arabia, actually, yeah. where they've been appointed as well. I think what we're talking about is it's going to take some time for the traditional values mm -hmm. and the rights of women to be able to line up yeah. so that some advancement can happen. Yeah. And so I think I, I said duly noted that mm -hmm. I will take your concerns back in, to our staff and our staff members here, and we'll look at ways that we can maybe be helpful in that conversation. It's very good, yeah. I think it's an important point that uh, you have to consider. Yeah, you have yeah. to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I understand. Okay. Well, thank you for raising it. Thank okay. you for here. Give okay. the mic to this gentleman right next to you. I am Greg Fay from the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Yes. Um, and I am also going to ask a question about a specific location, which is actually a neighbor of Afghanistan and is China. I'd like to ask you about your visit to China and how you as a, as a faith leader and as a believer in interfaith dialogue um, were received in a country where the, the government is officially atheist and cracks down on religious believers, especially the Uyghurs who are a Muslim people in, in north, northwestern China. Um, and this, this concept of female faces of faith, also in, in our organization's research of the Chinese government's crackdown on Uyghurs, we found that they have targeted women leaders. So they're clearly afraid of women leading Uyghur religious belief. Um, and I, I'm wondering if that's something that came up when, when you were in China. Okay, so ask me your specific question. What I mean, sort of. What did we talk about? What did you talk about? <laughs> and, <laughs> and what came out of that meeting? And, and what maybe do you hope to? come out in the future. Let me say this about religious freedom, that you know we're looking for long-term success, and it takes a lot of time. Sometimes you can only plant a seed. You know, It's just like that cup of water. You don't know which drop is going to make it overflow, but you continue to put water in. And so let me say this. You know, my, my diplomatic engagement is primarily with government leaders. That's where we're invited by them. Our embassies make the arrangements, and we have the engagements. But we are able offline to talk with leaders of other faith groups. And so because of, of restrictions, we can't identify who those are. And we don't want to make sure, you know, we leave the country. We come back here. They still have to leave. So we don't want to make it difficult for anyone. But I will say that there is the fact that I was invited and had the opportunity to sit with leadership there was an opening because religious freedom has been a, an an exceptionally touchy subject. And after, it also happened after our human rights report came out. The day that our human rights report came out, the next day I was in China. So you know, you have to understand the climate, and you make as much headway as you can. Um, one of the audience said that she, you know, she produces a show here. Um, I used to produce a show. When I first came to Washington, I worked for WJLA TV. I was a producer, one of two black producers in the country. So the show that I produced was called Headliners. And anyone who was famous, you know, coming through Washington, coming to Washington was on my show. Kathleen Matthews used to host it. And, you know, we wanted to make sure everyone's, the, the light was shown on them. Well, religious freedom is the absolute opposite. We don't want the light to shine because people's very lives can be taken because they were identified. So I can suffice it to say that I did have some very strong conversations. And we pressed the government to recognize all religious beliefs, including those who are not part of the state-sanctioned religions. We pressed them very hard on wanting to visit with all the religious groups there. And there were some conversations with those who were not part of the state-sanctioned groups. 
So we continue to press. We, have, we are part of the human rights dialogue with China. We will continue to have conversation and hopefully an action plan for some openness. But it was a strong conversation and we will continue to press. We don't ignore any country at any time. Uh, we have a staff of 16 wonderful, wonderful people, both civil servants and foreign service officers. And there's a region that concentrates on China. And so you can be sure that we are constantly pressing and constantly urging the government to lift some of its restrictions and really recognize all the people there who have a right to worship. Question way in back. Uh, my name is Benjamin Abdul Haq, uh, Officer Protocol at the Nation's Mosque. Hello, and Officer Lamar. Welcome to you, too. Oh, big mess Thank you. And on behalf of the uh, resident Imam Talib Sharif, who couldn't be here, he wanted to, because you all know each other. Yeah, he please give my He was unable to make it. Okay. Um, but I told him you're doing a fine job <laughs> in you, his absence. You. Yes. Thank you. Uh, in, in your travels, when you get invitations, no matter which country, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, and audience, is there an opportunity to request that they have youth at each one of these venues so that we can begin to include the youth also under the umbrella, so to speak, of the uh, females of faith? Very much so. We have, we urge that there be youth, that there be those who are disabled, you know, at each conference. Um, and also, one of the programs that Pete's working on is we call the International Visitors Program. We encourage young people, and so many young people are brought to the State Department from almost every country that I have audiences with. But in terms of going forward, it's not just women we want at the table, we want youth as well, because youth are the voices that need to be heard. As you look at many of the movements that have happened in the Middle East and in Africa, you know, they were initiated because of social media and youth basically say, you know, meet me in the square. And, you know, so we are, we're really actively wanting to have conversation and involvement with you. So the answer is yes. I have a question. Okay, this lady and then uh, Professor Wee. Hello, I'm Angela Turnbull. Such an honor to be here. Glad to meet you. be inspired by you. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could Now, where are you from? Um, are you a student or? Well, I'm a, well, hmm. I'm a civil servant. Okay. I'm a mother. Nice. <laughs> nice. And I'm a member of St. Augustine's <clears throat> Catholic Church. Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you. Best choir in the city. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a twofold question. I was wondering of the relationship of the U.S. Institute of Peace under the, the State Department, and okay. if there's any collaboration or efforts with um, the work that you do, because I have a, a strong interest in that organization. And as a citizen, mm -hmm. I was wondering, because you, you know, um, I know NGOs and other broader organizations are involved with the efforts in your office, but as a citizen, are there things that, that we can do to help support the broader goals, particularly the issues impacting girls and women, you know, the sex trafficking issue, mm -hmm. and you know, we're the more vulnerable communities that really need uh, protection. So I was curious. Her first question was, was there a relationship between the State Department and the U.S. Institute of Peace, which is directly across the street? Yeah, very much so. <laughs> um, many of our State Department personnel are on the board as well. We do many of our activities. We have begun to work with them on the Female Faces of Faith, our particular office, with Susan Hayward and their office, in terms of trying to do a summit actually, that's civil society as well as religious leaders for women of faith. And they continue to have a, an ongoing um, effort for women uh, of faith. And they're working also with Catherine Marshall and some of the universities. So yeah, so there's, there's a relationship and much dialogue and much action. We're trying to get it from, from talk to kind of really action. The second is what can an average citizen, what a civil servant can do who may be interested in a particular area. I would say that it would start in your places like St. Augustine, mm -hmm. who have a particular focus if there's a committee that's dealing with trafficking or whatever, because the, the numbers and the collaborative efforts bring more strength to the table. So perhaps your religious leader or perhaps the head of the human trafficking ministry may be invited to a summit that they're doing on human trafficking. So I think it starts at the local level, and this is a wonderful place, and that's a wonderful question, where you can get involved. I mean, I know there's a, there are many organizations here in, in Washington, D.C. One is Courtney's House, since you mentioned human trafficking, um, that a, a woman who was actually trafficked as a child 
is now, you know, helping get young people off the streets here. So it's, it's in, you have to get involved in the issue, and the issue then brings you to the table. So I would say where you have an interest, pursue it. And DC is filled with opportunities and organizations. I mean, this is, I think, the headquarters of, of almost everyone that I know. So find what your issue that drives you and that you're passionate about, and find a place locally to start working. That brings you then to the national level. That's how all of us got there. I mean, I was a local parish, parish pastor who, you know, for many years was you know, on New York City's trench, in New York City's trenches, you know, and at some point that brings national attention to because you've stayed focused on this issue, you've accomplished some things. Um, I did 32 years of pastoring inner city New York. That's a lot. 21 years of NYPD. That's a lot of years. So, you know, you kind of pay your dues, but then then your issue then makes room for you at new tables. That's a week. Thank you very much, and thanks so much for your leadership You're in this critical. Tell period. me who you are again, please. Uh, Paul Wee, uh, mm -hmm. Elliott School of International Affairs, George Washington. Yes, a pleasure to University. meet you, sir. I've been over there. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, my question has to do with the relationship of, uh, in a general way, uh, human rights and uh, foreign policy. Mm -hmm. But the particular case is Ethiopia, working with uh, uh, local groups, Muslims and Christians in Ethiopia um, on attempts to try to forestall what might be coming in the way of major conflicts between those two groups. Um, my impression is, however, that in dealing with the, uh, the U.S. State Department and even the International Religious Freedom uh, Department of the State Department, that um, the real push on human rights is somewhat uh, um, lessened, let me say, by the fact that uh, the U.S. needs Ethiopia for its drone bases and for other things. So that the, the pressure to, and I thought this was theoretically linked, namely that foreign aid to a country is linked to its human rights record. Uh, but it seems to be waived in this case, if I can just say it uh, bluntly, uh, as the U.S. needs Ethiopia, maybe more than Ethiopia needs the U.S. And um, I find little interest in pursuing particular human rights cases among those two groups uh, with which I work. Thank you. Okay. So that was my question. Um, <laughs> Did you, you want to ask a specific question or you want to just your comment to be noted? Because it really, you gave me information. No, my, I guess my question opinion. is, um, is there the, the, the link? We will not give foreign aid to countries who violate human rights. I mean, that is the theoretical foundation of U.S. foreign policy. Well, let me just respond in this way. Um, number one, we don't ignore any country. Um, there are needs mutually that are beneficial between countries. Um, let me say, in, a, in Ethiopia, number one, we have a U.S. ambassador for the African Union who we continue to work with. We have our Deputy Assistant Secretary, Karen Hanrahan, who's really focused on Ethiopia. We take each country situationally because there are many things beyond religious freedom that are happening in a country. My lane, again, is religious freedom. And as Ethiopia and religious freedom come together, then I'm brought to the table. But I can share with you that no country is ignored. And not, you know, in each country, we find in some situations, it's better to keep the engagement and the doors open. And so the president and the secretary have to weigh whether that's the best decision for that particular country. So I, beyond religious freedom, I can't comment on it because it's not my lane. But thank you for your comment. And it'll be duly noted on tape. This gentleman had a question. Oh, okay. uh, wait, wait for the mic, sir, please. Ambassador Cook, it's an honor to be here. And um, I'm Stan Cosby. I'm a psychologist. And, um, I, I remember him. It was an awesome show. Thank you so much. I didn't win an Emmy, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> and we're dating ourselves too, right? Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, as a psychologist, I'm always looking for the upside. I'm always, because I see so much of the downside. Um, have you observed, and first, first and foremost, I'm just so e elated that a sister walked in here because <laughs> truly, I, I, didn't ex I didn't know I didn't expect you to be an African American in such a high position. It is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Why have you observed in other countries that similar kind of wonderfulness? I, and I think it goes back to the, the gentleman right in front of you talking about Mozambique and Liberia. I, I find, um, and it's very important for us to shine a light on bright spots where it is working. Um, but I find, um, you know, number one, as an African American woman and as a faith leader, many people have that reaction because they're not expecting your sister to walk in. But there's a delight that there is because uh, there's a sharing of culture in many respects and there's a sharing of faith respect. And so I have found the wonderfulness is that the dialogue has been more open in places where they said it was not happening before. Because my presence in many respects really opens a lot of doors. People Google, you know, so they know my history when I come there. And so they're kind of like, okay. So I go to places like the Vatican, where as a Baptist pastor, you know, I couldn't go in. But as the ambassador for international religious freedom, I'm walked all the way in to the Pope. Yes. So that's wonderful. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's miraculous where you come from. So there are places like that. The fact that, um, you know, the president and the secretary recognize that, you know, a faith leader can come to the table, I think that's wonderful because what that does is it draws other faith leaders to the table, whether they're in civil society or whether they're in government. And conversations can happen that never happened before. So diplomatic engagement, I think the paradigm is shifting because it's much more culturally and religiously sensitive than it's been. Um, you know, and, and we're going to do what we have to do diplomatically, but you also have to, as you go in, you gotta, you got to understand where people are coming from, their history. And, and I think that that's been wonderful, that people are like, she, she kind of knows. Mm -hmm. You know, she knows us. She at least respects us. She, she's found common ground with us. And then we can hit the hard questions, you know, kind of like, this is where you are, religious freedom. Come, what are we going to do about that? Um, so that's been wonderful that the doors have been opened, that I've been, you know, to 25 countries uh, representing this nation, um, representing our president and our secretary and being able to advise them. That's wonderful. And then to see, I would say women all over the world um, are drawn to another woman coming in the room. And whether they can speak at that particular moment, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or whether they have to wait till the cameras are off. Um, there's, there's a magnetism that you are at least a voice at the table, and, um, and we want to model that. We want some of that. So I think, you know, again, we're looking at long-term success. We won't see it overnight, but I think you're going to see the, the emergence of more women leaders. I think you're going to see the emergence of more um, people in the diplomatic corps on both sides of the waters coming together and saying, you know, let's talk. So I think that those are some wonderful things that I've seen happen. And, and if I could have played just a small part in that, then that's wonderful for me. Well, Ambassador Johnson Cook, dear guests, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, I think it's been a particularly good dialogue thank having you. sat here before for a number of them. And I thank you. And uh, You need to know Peter has been a, an ambassador for years because we've been trying to do this for <laughs> almost two years. So I want to thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure. Thank You're a great you. moderator. Let's give him a hand. Let's give him a hand. <laughs>